It's become one of the most iconic moments of the current generation of Star Trek. In the fifth episode of the second season of Star Trek Discovery, Saints of Imperfection, Captain Christopher Pike prepares the crew to embark on a dangerous mission to rescue Ensign Tilly from the mycelial network by declaring, Starfleet is a promise. I give my life for you, you give your life for me. And nobody gets left behind. Captain Pike, as depicted in Discovery, has become, for many fans, the embodiment of everything Starfleet is supposed to stand for. He's principled, brave, selfless, open-minded, and loyal to the people he serves with. And those characteristics are certainly important, perhaps even necessary, to being a member of Starfleet. But if you watch enough Star Trek, you might start to notice a few other qualities that a person seemingly needs in order to be successful. Mental and physical toughness, resilience, the ability and willingness to never miss work no matter what. Think about how many life-altering, potentially crushing traumas we've seen Starfleet officers endure over the years in the various iterations of Star Trek. Think about how often they've no sooner survived these ordeals than they're right back on duty as though nothing ever happened. And... Think about what that implies about the kind of organization Starfleet is. That's enough to make me wonder, is Starfleet actually negligent toward its officers? Let me begin our exploration of this question with a simple observation. Yes, Starfleet is negligent toward its officers. I mean, come on, obviously. Star Trek shows us members of Starfleet being abducted, tortured, possessed by malevolent beings, having their ship or space station, as the case may be, brought to the brink of destruction on a weekly basis. They hardly ever take time off of their own volition, and we almost never see their superiors suggesting leave so they can recover. Imagine any other employer treating people this way. Upton Sinclair would be writing books about it. Or they'd be flying themselves into space. To be fair, if Starfleet gave its officers time off to recover from the psychologically scarring ordeals they were constantly going through, there wouldn't be anyone left to fly the ships. And most of what seems like Starfleet's heartless attitude toward the mental and emotional well-being of its personnel is a side effect of the fact that these people have the bad luck to be living in TV shows where the status quo is reset at the end of the episode. It's a result of the form more so than any intention on the part of the creators to portray Star Trek in any particular way. Even so, there are a few extreme cases from throughout the history of the Star Trek franchise where it seems like an exception to the get up and go to work the next day no matter what standard practice should have been made. For example, did Kirk get to take a few days after the events of City on the Edge of Forever? Given the rigidly episodic format of Star Trek The Original Series, it's not clear how much time is supposed to have passed between episodes. So, I suppose it's possible Kirk and Spock were afforded a break to get their heads together. Perhaps they took that trip to Vulcan, Spock proposes, at the end of Harlan Ellison's original script for the episode. If Kirk didn't take some time, he probably should have. Hell, all three of them should have Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Let's review. McCoy accidentally injects himself with a megadose of a drug that makes him go crazy, then he leaps through a talking time donut and winds up on Earth in the 1930s. Kirk and Spock follow him through the talking time donut. Kirk falls in love with Edith Keeler, finds out she has to die in order for history to be set right, watches her get hit by a truck, stops McCoy from saving her. McCoy also watches her get hit by the truck. Then they all return to their own time. That's quite an adventure, and I'm sure they'd all benefit from having some time to recover from it. Even Spock. I know he always looks like nothing bothers him, but who knows how deeply messed up he is beneath that calm Vulcan exterior. There's another example from Classic Trek. There are lots of examples, I'm not going to mention them all, but... There's another example in the episode The Doomsday Machine, when Commodore Matt Decker, mere hours after seeing the entire crew of his starship destroyed by the planet killer, takes command of the Enterprise in Captain Kirk's absence. It's a point of contention in the episode whether or not Decker can 
take command, Spock and McCoy both object, but ultimately obey the orders of Decker, their superior officer. McCoy suggests to Spock that he declare Decker medically unfit and have him relieved on that basis, but Spock refuses to go along with it since McCoy hasn't actually examined Decker. The thing is, when they found Decker in the aftermath of the planet killer attack, he was in bad shape. He was clearly very traumatized. There's no way he was fit for duty. McCoy should have been able to use his discretion as chief medical officer to prevent Decker from assuming command of the ship or from doing anything in an official capacity as a Starfleet officer. Dude just watched a giant space funnel eat the planet where his crew was. He's not okay. I guess there isn't a Starfleet regulation covering such a circumstance, which would allow Spock or McCoy to simply say to Decker, nope, not you, out of the chair, but there should be. In Star Trek The Next Generation, there are so many times when characters should have been allowed a bit of recovery time or even compelled to take some, but instead we see them right back to work in the very next episode, often by the end of the same episode. The most egregious examples of this I can think of involve Captain Picard himself. The dude gets assimilated by the Borg, and he's back in uniform and in command of the Enterprise by the end of The Best of Both Worlds Part 2. I know the next episode family shows him taking some time off and establishes that he has at least been working with Counselor Troy, but even so, I don't think there's another single image from all of Star Trek that illustrates the point of this video better than that shot of Picard, face bandaged from the freshly removed Borg implants, in uniform, behind his desk, back at work. Picard also lives through the inner light, and I do mean lives through. He's psychically abducted into the life of another person, eventually comes to accept it as his real life, experiences decades of that life, then finds out that actually it wasn't his real life after all, and wakes up back on the Enterprise where only a few minutes have passed. How much do you want to bet he was up and on time for his next duty shift? And how could I forget one of my favorite TNG episodes, and probably the worst trauma Picard lives through other than his Borg assimilation, Chain of Command. Picard is held captive and tortured by Cardassians for days. The experience is so brutal that, as the episode reveals in its closing moments, Picard was actually broken. Though he puts on a courageous display against his tormentor, Gul Madred, angrily declaring that there are four lights, which there are. When he's alone with Troy after being released, he admits that at the end, he could see five lights, as Madred kept insisting there were. It's a devastating and important scene, the brave captain of the Enterprise admitting that he is not okay. So why is he in uniform? Why is he back in command of his ship? Why is this conversation with Troy being presented as a quick aside before he gets back to work? What's a torture survivor got to do to take a vacation around here, for God's sake? Like I said, there are plenty of examples of this sort of thing in TNG involving characters other than Picard, but if I list them all, we'll be here all day. It was less common on Deep Space Nine, where the episodes were generally not as standalone in nature, especially in the latter seasons, but it still happened. And I think you know where I'm going for this one. There he is. I'd say God bless him, but he suffered so much. And what God would stand by and allow that? Besides all of them, I mean. I already talked about what I consider to be the darkest O'Brien Must Suffer episode in a previous video, Season 4's Hard Time, but I'm not sure that's the best example of the kind of Starfleet negligence I'm focusing on here. True, we don't see O'Brien taking time off or going through any sort of treatment to help him recover from his experience in Hard Time, an experience that pushes him to the brink of suicide. But the episode at least pays lip service to the fact that a recovery will be necessary and won't be easy. It's not much, but there are other similar episodes that don't even do that much. Look at what O'Brien goes through in Season 2. He nearly dies after being exposed to a biological weapon in the episode Armageddon Game. Then, in the very next episode, Whispers, he's abducted by aliens and replaced by a replicant. The episode ends with the real O'Brien watching his replicant, who believed he was the real O'Brien, die 
And then in the episode after that, Paradise, O'Brien and Sisko find themselves held captive by a cult that rejects technology. Now, granted, Sisko suffers a lot more in that episode than O'Brien does, but it's not exactly a vacation for Miles either, and I think the dude deserves a break. Then, closer to the end of season two, we get the episode Tribunal, where O'Brien finds himself on Cardassia being put on trial for a crime he didn't commit, facing execution. That's just one year out of this guy's life. And the next year, in season three's episode Visionary, he's exposed to radiation that causes him to start jumping back and forth in time. Before the episode is over, he's seen the station explode and gotten to stand over his own dead body again. O'Brien doesn't appear in the following episode, Distant Voices, the real O'Brien, at least. He shows up as a part of Bashir's coma dream, so I guess we can pretend he took a week off? But who are we kidding? And even if O'Brien did choose to take some time off for himself, that's not what this video is about. I'm not talking about how Starfleet officers never take time off. I'm talking about how Starfleet, as an organization, fosters this culture of never taking time off for people who work incredibly stressful jobs that routinely push them beyond their limits physically and emotionally. That culture is so deeply ingrained in Starfleet officers that it even remains in the absence of Starfleet itself. Let's take a look at Voyager. More specifically, let's review some of the adventures of Voyager's resident totem of pain and abuse, our forever ensign. Harry Kim. I know we all talk about how unfair it is that Harry spends the entire seven-year run of Voyager as a member of the senior staff, often saving the day, but never gets promoted, but that's the least of the poor guy's problems. I don't think any other single character approaches the amount of misery poured upon O'Brien, but if there's an O'Brien of Voyager, it's Harry. In the season one episode, Emanations, Harry finds himself accidentally beamed into an alien coffin. His sudden, inexplicable appearance threatens to destroy the religious beliefs of this society, and in order to get back to his ship, he needs to climb back into the coffin and allow himself to be euthanized and transported back to the asteroid where he started in the hopes that Voyager will detect his presence in time for the Doctor to resuscitate him. And that's what happens, and Harry's okay in the end, but Jesus! Dude's only a few months out of the Academy, and not only does he get yanked into the Delta Quadrant 70,000 light years from home on his first mission, he's been accidentally beamed into a coffin, killed, and brought back to life? At the end of Emanations, Janeway meets with Harry and... orders him to take some time off to deal with his experience. It's so easy to become jaded, to treat the extraordinary like just another day at the office, she tells him. But sometimes there are experiences which transcend all that. You've just had one, Mr. Kim, and I want you to live with it for a little while. Forgot about that part. <sighs> Janeway did the right thing. Ordering Harry to take some time off to recover, to reflect. Harry even tells her that... He's okay to come back to work. And she's like, no, take a break. So the toxic no days off Starfleet culture does still exist on Voyager, but in this instance, at least, Janeway is aware of it and takes time to make sure her young officer doesn't fall prey to that mindset. Voyager did it right this time. Did not see that coming. This part of the video is off to kind of an awkward start. I don't feel right. The good news, for my thesis anyway, is that since this is Voyager we're talking about, the portrayal of Janeway as a commander who cares about the mental health of her crew is not something which the writers maintain with any consistency, including when it comes to the misadventures of one Harry Kim. In fact, the second season episode Deadlock, where the original Harry is killed and replaced by another version of Harry from a duplicate Voyager created by a subspace whatchamacallit, ends with another conversation between Harry and Janeway. Harry is clearly going through something, struggling to process what's just happened, the fact that he's Harry, 
but not the Harry who belongs here, but also no different from the Harry who belongs here, so he might as well belong here. It's weird, he says, displaying an impressive mastery of understatement for someone of his youthful age. And this time, instead of telling him to take some time off to get his head together, Janeway just kind of smirks at him and says, Weird is part of the job. Now get to the bridge, you're on duty in five minutes. I added that last part myself, though in the actual dialogue, I do feel it was implied. Two weeks after that comes the thaw, where Harry is among the crew members trapped in virtual reality and tormented by an evil clown. The week after that, he's right back to work. And that's the episode where Harry's working on the transporter when Tuvok and Neelix are combined into Tuvix. I know they eventually settled on the magic flower as the cause of that particular incident, but couldn't it have also been that Harry was still dealing with the whole tortured in virtual reality by the space joker thing, and his mind wasn't as on his work as it should have been? In the absence of any supporting or contradictory evidence, I'm just going to assume the answer is yes. Thanks, confirmation bias. So, if Harry is the O'Brien of Voyager, who's the Harry of Enterprise? In terms of the trauma and suffering, I mean, because if we're looking at character types, Travis is the Harry of Enterprise, the fresh-faced young rookie who's eager to get out there and see what the galaxy has in store. But Travis isn't Enterprise's designated sufferer. I think that mantle is carried by the ship's chief engineer, Trip Tucker. Charles Tucker III! And with a name like that, you kind of want him to suffer, don't you? No wonder they call him Trip. Trip's suffering begins early in Enterprise's first season. In the episode Strange New World, a dose of space pollen makes him paranoid that the rest of the crew is trying to kill him. In the next episode, Unexpected, Trip gets pregnant. A couple of episodes after that, Trip, along with Captain Archer and T'Pol, is taken hostage at a Vulcan monastery by Andorians. A bit later in the season, Trip is stranded with Lieutenant Reed in a shuttle pod and nearly suffocates. Several episodes after that, Trip and Archer get lost in a desert, and Trip nearly dies. That's one season. No time off, no counselor on the ship, not even a wise bartender or a nice lady with no relevant skills who everybody pretends is the counselor. I guess Trip could have had some heart-to-hearts with Chef in between missions. Maybe that helped. Some pecan pie and a little informal talk therapy? I don't know. The pie sounds good, though, don't it, Trip? I'm right there with you, buddy. Nothing like a good pecan pie. Have a scoop of vanilla ice cream or a dollop of Cool Whip with it, though. You know how rich pecan pie is. Anyway... Things are a bit different when we get to Star Trek Discovery. It's not that we see Starfleet officers taking time off or being ordered to take time off following stressful missions, but the show at least acknowledges that post-traumatic stress is a thing and that constantly having to deal with, you know, a bunch of Star Trek stuff takes a heavy psychological toll on these characters. We see this in the first season with Ash Tyler, who experiences post-traumatic stress after just everything, really. But my favorite example of a Discovery character dealing with trauma comes in Season 3 with Lieutenant Detmer. She's at the helm when Discovery crashes into a planet soon after emerging from a time warp into the 32nd century and spends most of the rest of the season struggling to deal with issues related to that experience. We see Detmer losing her self-confidence, lashing out at others in anger, and eventually admitting that she's not okay, seeking help, and working to overcome the injuries inflicted by her trauma. Detmer's initial reluctance to deal with her problems stemming from the crash is attributed in part to the fact that she's a pilot and pilots are macho, but this is clearly an issue that goes far beyond pilots, since virtually every Starfleet character we've ever seen in any Star Trek series has responded to stress and trauma this way. Discovery acknowledging it and making it an explicit part of a character's development only emphasizes the underlying issue that Starfleet encourages its personnel to work harder than they should and to respond to the harm caused by stress and trauma by ignoring it and pushing through rather than actually dealing with it. Most of the time, we can only speculate on what the harm caused by the harrowing experiences survived by Starfleet officers looks like. 
Detmer is an exception. We actually get to see what it does to her. O'Brien in Hard Time is an exception too, though once that episode is over, it's no longer an issue. There are other exceptions as well, but most of these are found in single isolated scenes, like the scene between Janeway and Harry I mentioned earlier. But every once in a while, a handful of times throughout the pre-discovery eras of the franchise, Star Trek writers have gone beyond such token scenes and given us entire episodes where a character's difficulty in dealing with and recovering from trauma, and by extension Starfleet's failure to adequately support them through those difficulties, is at the heart of the story. I want to talk about two of these episodes. The first one being a show from Classic Trek's first season titled Court Martial. This episode, strangely enough, deals with the court-martial of Captain Kirk after his actions lead to the death of a crew member. The records officer of the Enterprise, Ben Finney, is operating the ship's ion pod, which is a thing that it has that someone needs to operate for some reason. Don't worry about it, it's not important, when the severity of the ion storm forces Kirk to eject the pod, causing Finney's death. At first, it seems like one of those no-win scenarios Starfleet is always telling its officers to be ready for, like the Kobayashi Maru test, or that time in TNG where Troy has to order Hologram Geordi to his death in order to earn a promotion. But there's a problem. The Ion Pod is only supposed to be ejected in a serious emergency, meaning that the ship should be on red alert when it happens. But the computer records show that Kirk ejected the pod while the Enterprise was still on yellow alert which would have given Finney no warning and no chance to exit the pod before it was ejected. Kirk can't explain that. There's another complication. Kirk and Finney have some history. Years ago, they served together on the USS Republic. Finney made a technical error that could have potentially endangered the ship. Kirk corrected the error and reported Finney as regulations required him to do. As a result, Finney was reprimanded and his career was thrown off track. He apparently blamed Kirk for the fact that he was still only a lieutenant commander. Commodore Stone, who is overseeing the investigation into what happened, doesn't like how any of this looks and advises Kirk to accept responsibility for Finney's death and take a ground assignment rather than go through with a full court-martial, which could be embarrassing for Starfleet. And Kirk's like, you want me to choose not to have a court hearing? Maybe they have different ways of resolving disputes in those other sci-fi franchises, but this is Star Trek, buddy. Space the final frontier, and here we rely on the arbitration process. So the court-martial gets underway, and things aren't looking good for Kirk. Fortunately, Spock has been conducting his own investigation of what happened, and eventually he discovers that the Enterprise's computer has been tampered with, the records altered, to make it look like Kirk ejected the ion pod before calling Red Alert when that's not what actually happened. The only crew members with the access to reprogram the computer like that are the captain and first officer, Kirk and Spock, and the records officer, Ben Finney. The court-martial convenes aboard the Enterprise. The ship has been entirely evacuated except for the participants in the hearing who are gathered on the bridge. Spock uses the ship's internal sensors to amplify the sounds of the heartbeats of everyone aboard. Then, one by one, Dr. McCoy uses a magic mic to mask out the heartbeats of all of the people on the bridge. When he's done, there's still the sound of a single heartbeat. Spock pinpoints the location of that heartbeat, and it's coming from under the floor. Tear up the planks! It's the beating of his hideous heart! Oh, like you weren't thinking it. Unless you never read that story, or heard of that story. In which case, my condolences on your poor education. The single remaining heartbeat is coming from engineering, so Kirk grabs a phaser and heads down there, and hey, look, it's Finney! He's alive! And not having a very good day. Furious that his plan to fake his death and frame Kirk for it has failed, Finney now intends to blow up the ship. But then Kirk beats him up, and Finney tells where he sabotaged the ship so Kirk can fix it. And the charges against Kirk are dismissed, and the court-martial is over, and everybody lives happily ever after. Except Finney. Because faking your own death and framing someone for murder is a crime, apparently. I thought the Federation was supposed to be a utopia. 
Court Martial is not an episode about Starfleet's negligence toward its officers, but I think we can infer that negligence from the character of Finney. It's not the trauma of an intense, life-threatening experience that breaks Finney, but the consequences of a personal failure. Even so, the effect is much the same. Finney is obviously not okay. He carries a grudge against Kirk for years after the incident on the Republic, waiting for the opportunity to take revenge. Kirk apparently knew that Finney bore him ill will about this, and it stands to reason that other people knew about it too, and yet Starfleet allowed Finney to be assigned to the Enterprise under the direct command of Kirk, the man he blamed for not being promoted to captain himself. And not only does he get assigned to the Enterprise, he's made records officer, which, for the purposes of this episode at least, is a position of some authority. Sure seems like somebody in the personnel department dropped the ball in allowing this unstable and resentful officer to serve aboard the starship commanded by the guy he blamed for all his problems. And it seems like someone in Starfleet should have recognized that Finney was not okay and intervened to get him the help he so desperately needed before he had the chance to, you know, almost ruin Kirk's career and then almost blow up the ship when that didn't work. Starfleet's failure to support its officers' mental health and the harm that comes from that is even more central to the second example I want to talk about. And while Finney's issues in court-martial were caused by his difficulty in dealing with a personal failure, the officer in question in this next episode is struggling with the after-effects of a trauma that is more in line with what I've been talking about for most of this video. That officer's name is Captain Ben Maxwell. Another Ben. Hmm. Coincidence? Are you okay? Anyway, the episode is from the fourth season of Star Trek The Next Generation, and it's called The Wounded. And would you look at that? It's an O'Brien episode! An O'Brien episode where O'Brien isn't the suffering party. How about that? It's actually not that unusual. This is a TNG episode, remember. The O'Brien must suffer trope didn't really come into play until the start of Deep Space Nine. O'Brien had a few rough times aboard the Enterprise, but nothing that would have prepared him for the relentless living hell that lay ahead. In The Wounded, he gets to be the hero without suffering at all. Unless you count having to kinda sorta acknowledge your own racism to be a form of suffering which a lot of us white folks do, if the entirety of American history right up to this very moment is any indication. Anyway, Ben Maxwell. He's the captain of the Starship Phoenix, and he's played by Bob Gunton, so you know he's probably going to do something horrible at some point. He's also a veteran of the Federation's war with Cardassia, which was a super big deal that happened not too long ago, which we've never heard about because the producers just thought of it for this episode. The Wounded marks the debut of the Cardassians, actually. There were still a few kinks to work out in the costume department, but that's them, pretty much. To wit, when we meet the Cardassians, they're attacking the Enterprise, and when Captain Picard asks why, they insist it's actually Starfleet's fault. Classic Cardassians. The commander of the Cardassian ship, Gull Masset, the patty to Gull Dukat's Kathy, comes aboard the Enterprise with some of his people. As they're all leaving... Troy looks back at O'Brien like, I'm not sensing anything unusual. Whoa, I've never even heard most of the slurs you're thinking. It turns out the Cardassians were telling the truth, sort of. The attack on the Enterprise was a retaliatory strike for an attack made on a Cardassian science station by Maxwell's ship, the Phoenix. With Gull Masset and his officers remaining aboard the Enterprise, Picard and his people begin a search for the Phoenix, which disappeared after the attack on the science station. O'Brien is invited to a staff meeting because he served under Maxwell's command aboard the USS Rutledge during the Cardassian War and knows him pretty well. O'Brien tells everybody about how Maxwell's family was killed during the war when the Cardassians attacked a civilian outpost. Gull Masset jumps to the obvious conclusion that now Maxwell is hunting Cardassians to exact vengeance for the deaths of his family members. But O'Brien is like, no way. This is the 24th century. We don't succumb to revenge. We have a more evolved sensibility. And Picard's like, oh, good one. I'm going to remember that. 
After the meeting, O'Brien and Massette's subordinates are in a turbo lift together. One of them invites O'Brien out for a drink, and O'Brien says, look, no offense or anything, but I'd rather pee up my own nose until I drown than have to spend more than a few seconds alone with any of you, you spoon-headed, murdering animals. Again, no disrespect. The Enterprise locates the Phoenix on sensors as it's chasing a Cardassian supply ship. Before the Enterprise can catch up to it, the Phoenix has attacked and destroyed the supply ship, along with a Cardassian warship that was responding to help. Picard has a talk with O'Brien about Maxwell. O'Brien sneaks in a little brown-nosing, saying, I count myself lucky to have served under the two finest captains in Starfleet. Picard's like, two finest? So we're tied? You don't have, like, a number one and a number two? Picard asks how Maxwell responded to the loss of his family, and O'Brien says that while he's sure Maxwell was all broke up inside, he never missed a moment's duty. He was a model Starfleet officer. Mm-hmm. Picard's like, so he's not the kind of person to, I don't know, I'm just picking a hypothetical example totally at random, blow up starships full of people for no reason? No, O'Brien says. He'd never do that. It would be completely out of character for him. Never in a million years would he... He just did that, didn't he? Yep. So, now, if we can circle back to that two finest captains thing. The Enterprise catches up to the Phoenix, and Captain Maxwell beams aboard. Picard meets with him in the ready room and is like, so what's with all the acts of war and whatnot? Maxwell tells Picard that his Cardassian killing spree has been in the defense of the Federation. That science station he destroyed? Secret military supply outpost. And that supply ship? Carrying secret weapons. The Cardassians are arming for another war. And Picard's like, that does sound serious. Of course, you have evidence of this. Evidence! In my day, the only evidence you needed was your lust for revenge against the people who killed your family. So you admit this was all about personal retribution? What? No. When did I say that? Shut up. Picard makes Maxwell an offer. He'll allow him to return to the Phoenix and remain in command while the Enterprise escorts it back to a starbase where Maxwell will answer for what he's done. The alternative is Picard placing Maxwell under arrest and towing the Phoenix back to base. Maxwell's like, okay, fine, we can do the first thing. I'll bring my ship back to Starbase, just like you said, and I won't suddenly change course and fly off to attack another Cardassian ship or anything, I promise. I can tell you mean that. I'm glad we had this little talk. Maxwell returns to his ship, and like five minutes later, Data says, hey, the Phoenix has suddenly changed course to attack another Cardassian ship. That... Ooh, that is the last straw. They catch up to the Phoenix, again, but Maxwell hasn't destroyed the Cardassian ship yet. He hails the Enterprise and tells Picard to board the Cardassian ship because he'll find all the evidence he needs that Maxwell is right and the Cardassians are arming for war. Picard refuses, so Maxwell's like, fine, guess I'll just blow this one up too. Picard orders Worf to arm all weapons, but O'Brien offers to beam himself over to the Phoenix and try to talk Maxwell down first. Picard's like, sure, go ahead and try. If you fail, we can blow up the Phoenix anyway. I'm not that attached to you since you started in with that two finest captains. Like, are you saying we're evenly matched in every category? That doesn't even make sense. O'Brien finds Maxwell in his ready room on the Phoenix and tries to get him to knock it off. Maxwell says, if Picard wants this to end, he should board that Cardassian ship. Then he'll see that I've been doing this to protect the Federation, not because I'm consumed by unresolved grief and uncontrollable rage toward the race of soulless monster people who butchered my perfect family. Are... Sorry, are you saying you aren't consumed by grief and rage? Or you are, but that's not why you attack the Cardassians? Either one. Does it matter? Just shut up and sing. Sing for me, O'Brien. You know what I like. And O'Brien starts singing The Minstrel Boy, which was a favorite among the crew on the Rutledge back in the day and is, no kidding, one of my favorite songs in the world. So I always like this scene, as corny as it is. O'Brien and Maxwell sing the song together, and when it's over, Maxwell's like, okay, I give up, which I think means O'Brien's singing is either really good or really bad. I'm not sure which. The episode ends with Gull Massette and Picard saying goodbye in the observation lounge. Massette's like, well, I'm glad you finally arrested that Maxwell nutcase. What a case of nuts, right? And Picard says, P. 
people like Chief O'Brien are loyal to Maxwell because he earned that loyalty when he served with them. Maxwell was twice decorated during the war for courage and valor, and if he cannot find a role for himself in peace, we can pity him, but we shall not dismiss him. Do you think there might be more than those two options available, Captain? Could you, or somebody, I don't know, help him? Better yet, could somebody have helped him a few years ago before he went on a paranoid killing spree? Maybe there should be someone working at Starfleet whose job it is to check on members of the service who have just had their families wiped out and decide whether or not they need to take some time off or get some therapy. Maybe there should be an entire department at Starfleet dedicated to that. Captain Maxwell is probably the clearest evidence to date of how negligent Starfleet is toward its officers and of the nature of that negligence. He's not someone who has just suffered a terrible loss or endured a stressful experience who is pressed into service before he's ready because there's an emergency situation that demands it, as you could possibly argue in the case of, say, Commodore Decker in the Doomsday Machine. His traumatic incident occurred years before the events of the wounded, and according to O'Brien, he never took any time off, nor presumably was he compelled to take any time off by someone whose job it was to see to his best interests. And in the wounded, we see the result. Now, to be fair, the negligence of Starfleet toward Maxwell is not what that episode is about. Through the story of Maxwell and also the story of O'Brien, the wounded is about how war can leave people with injuries that linger on long after the visible scars have healed, injuries which the people who carry them may not even be aware of, as we see with O'Brien, who doesn't seem to recognize the prejudice he still carries toward Cardassians. But Starfleet's negligence, or rather the result of it, is present in the episode as it is present in many other episodes from throughout the franchise. And I think it's fair and important to point it out and to take it as a lesson. That lesson has nothing to do with the quality of Star Trek, by the way. The fact that I can make all these criticisms about how Starfleet treats its officers doesn't mean Star Trek or a given episode of Star Trek is a badly written show. My philosophy is story should always come first. The Wounded is a fantastic episode, one of the best of TNG's entire seven-year run for my money. Jerry Taylor, who is credited with writing that teleplay, and everyone else involved in conceiving and shaping that story wanted to tell a story about a veteran who couldn't let go of the war come peacetime, and they told that story. And if, in the course of telling that story, they made Starfleet look like an organization that doesn't take care of its officers the way it should, I'm okay with that. My purpose in saying Starfleet is negligent toward its officers isn't to argue that the writers of Star Trek should rehab Starfleet into a more sensitive and responsible organization. I honestly couldn't care less about that. My purpose is to remind all of you watching, and to remind myself, honestly, that if you're going through something, if you're dealing with stress or trauma or health issues, be they physical or mental, and you're having a hard time with it, that's okay. It's okay to admit you're not okay. It's okay to ask for help, or just to ask for some time and some space. And if you're in that situation, and your employer is ignoring it, or telling you that you need to ignore it and get back to work, or neglecting the well-being of a co-worker in the same way, that's not okay. Agreeing to work for someone doesn't mean you agree to let them exploit you or neglect you. And I know it's not always an easy problem to fix. Many people who work for exploitative employers are doing so in the first place because there aren't any better options available to them. And I think it's important to acknowledge that and to be aware of that problem too. But whether or not we can do anything about it, we should all at least be aware that if we're being mistreated and taken for granted in this way, it's wrong. One of the wonderful things about Star Trek is that it has so much to teach us. Often, it teaches by giving us positive examples to follow. It's even done that a time or two when it comes to characters dealing with stress and trauma. 
I've already mentioned the scene between Janeway and Harry at the end of Emanations and how Lieutenant Detmer's character arc in Discovery's third season builds up to her admitting that she's not okay and asking for help. There's also Nog in Deep Space Nine who loses his leg in battle and subsequently spends an entire episode in the Hollow Suite struggling with post-traumatic stress. But sometimes Star Trek teaches us things it may not even mean to teach us. Starfleet officers and Starfleet itself aren't always examples worth following. If we see one of our heroes surviving some harrowing traumatic experience and going right back to work the next day like nothing happened, that doesn't mean that's what we should do. And if we see Starfleet neglecting the well-being of its officers, even if it's for the sake of a really good story, that doesn't mean we have to be, or ought to be, okay with the same thing happening to us. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be, but before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Laura Pantazis, thank you Laura, Tiffany Danger, thank you Tiffany, Christopher, thank you Christopher, Nautical Noodle, thank you Nautical Noodle, Kalina Senan, thank you Kalina, Tomsky Thompson, thank you Tomsky, and Mihailani Uchiyama, thank you Mihailani. Next up, new channel members, and they are Eric Hamian, thank you Eric Hamian, Tom Aschenbach, thank you Tom, Wolfie Basach, thank you Wolfie, and Charles Anderson Reed, thank you Charles. Those are the newest Patreon patrons to pledge $5 a month or more, and the newest channel members to join at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives and pledging any amount from a dollar a month on up, or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics, and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice-monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout-out at the end of a Trek Actually video. I could not do this without the support of my patrons and my members, so to all of you who support this channel with a monthly contribution, thank you so much for enabling me to have this wonderful job. And once again, if you want to help out, please go to patreon.com slash steveshives, or just click the join button below the video. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole. The three of us play characters who are low-ranking Starfleet officers. We are into our fourth season now, and our characters have jumped from the TOS era to the TNG era. Our show is a lot of fun to make, and judging by most of the comments we get, it's a lot of fun to listen to as well. If you're not listening, the links are in the description of this video. Please do check out the Ensign's Log. I think you'll really dig it. I also do a weekly watch-along live stream with Dana called Trek Reluctantly, where we watch episodes of Deep Space Nine, which Dana has never seen before, and also episodes of another series, or sometimes a movie, that I have never seen before. We started out watching Firefly on the off weeks from DS9, and then we switched to Magic Mike, and now we've just started watching the Netflix original animated series Hilda. And we also just finished the first season of DS9, and we're about to start season two. So whenever you're able to join us, we invite you to queue up whatever we're watching on your end and watch along with us. It's every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. So if you're interested and able, please join us for Trek Reluctantly. We'd love to have you. Now, let's talk about the next episode of this series. I've done videos in the past about particular characters in the Star Trek franchise. Some of my most popular videos and some of my personal favorites have been among them. My video about Worf, 
my video about Tasha Yar, my trilogy on the Deep Space Nine Cardassians. My first Trek Actually video was about Captain Jellico, a much maligned character who I thought and still think is actually pretty awesome. Well, next month's video will also be in that vein. It will also be about a much maligned Star Trek character who, contrary to popular opinion, I think is actually pretty not so bad. I'm talking about the Enterprise D's resident boy genius, Wesley Crusher. In defense of Wesley! That's next month. Plus, look for a new comment response video coming next week. Those are always fun. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you next time.